So this morning, we're going to get started with a topic ripped from the headlines, uh, cybersecurity and the safety of our supply chains. We start today with a special fireside chat with Nathan Symington. Nathan was confirmed to the FCC at the end of last year. He brings both private and public sector experience to the commission. Previously, he served as a senior advisor at NTIA. And in this role, he had many aspects of telecommunications policy, including spectrum allocation and planning, broadband access, and the US government's role in the management of the internet. Prior to joining the commission, Nathan was senior counsel to Brightstar Corporation, an international mobile devices services company. In that capacity, he led and negotiated communications equipment services transactions with leading providers in over 20 countries. Prior to joining Brightstar, he was in the private practice. Hailing from outside the beltway, he brings new ideas, fresh perspectives, and independent thought to his role at the FCC. His bold thinking and commitment to bipartisanship will be crucial to meet the myriad challenges and um, for both security and growth of our communications network. I'm delighted to welcome him on his inaugural appearance here at IGF USA to discuss the FC's role in securing vulnerabilities in our supply chain. Good morning and welcome, Nathan. Good morning, Melinda, and thank you for that very kind introduction. I'm delighted to join today, and uh, I want to thank everyone at IGF USA for the invitation to speak. The 5G transition has the potential to radically accelerate American innovation. When critical infrastructure is migrated to wireless services, we can build where we thought we couldn't, we can automate costly manual services, we can stay connected in an emergency, and in industry, it can be a total game changer. Gartner, a leading research and analysis company, estimates, for instance, that there will be over 30 billion connected IoT devices globally, and many of those will be wireless. That's 30 billion devices making, testing, and shipping products to our homes. For me, that's 30 billion reasons to take security seriously. We owe it to everyone to make sure that these connections deserve our trust and reliance. Whether it's critical services infrastructure on which we depend to navigate roads and railways, to get power delivered to our homes or places of business, or to receive help in a crisis, or on the other hand, whether it's industrial services that deliver us the products upon which we rely every day, none of it can happen without security. Not only will 5G be viewed as an unreliable and untrustworthy technology if there are splashy security failures, which stand to slow migration, but the security failures themselves can be costly to remediate. And as we saw with, for example, the Colonial Pipeline hack, a lot of trouble can be caused with just a little bit of an attack. Now, cybersecurity, understood as treatment of the software and human threat surfaces, is within the remit of other government agencies. I'm not proposing to have the FCC step in and muddle their work, but the physical layer security of wireless devices, that is not just securing networks, but securing the radio frequency signal or connection between the device and the network or between the device and another device, that is within the competency of the FCC and other agencies may not have the regulatory tools or in-house expertise to address this specific aspect of the problem, so it would be a dereliction of our duty not to critically examine and do what we can to harden the wireless networks on which we will all rely and on which we will come to further rely as we transition to 5G. And because, uh, because there's no one else to do it, we've got to step up. This means working closely with industry to set standards for physical layer and signal security. It means guarding against in intentional interference, such as signal injections. It means validating the source of a transmission at the device level. It means taking the spectrum security aspects, not as promised, but as carefully vouchsafed. Um, it may mean moving, moving to lower trust structures internally within networks or between networks. And it means close coordination among government agencies and industries to develop a product ecosystem that secures our vulnerable devices, from critical infrastructure on down to consumer electronics. Because as it stands, wireless devices just aren't difficult enough to hack. Some of you folks may have heard me talk about pineapples and stingrays, which probably sounds like I'm planning a, a trip to the Caribbean or something. But what I'm actually saying is that anyone with an Amazon account and a high school education can build a device that interferes potentially maliciously with a wireless device or network through physical layer vulnerabilities. So we have a duty to examine these vulnerabilities critically and to remediate them where possible. And it is in that examination that I would ask for the help of all of those in attendance. 
If you think about physical layer security, signal security, RF fingerprinting, and related topics, or know someone who does, please reach out. We're going to reply to your email or call. We want to develop as robust a record as we can and take notice of every fact available to us as we develop solutions. And we want to make sure that we consult thoroughly with industry so that any regulatory actions that happen at the commission level have been thoroughly weighed and no one has to worry that they will come out of left field, be damaging, be unsettling, or be, just be inappropriate to your industry. So thanks again, Melinda, and the entire IGF USA team for the invitation. And I'm looking forward to the chat. Great, thank you so much. And I uh, do encourage our, all of our audience to take heed of that call to action and contribute because cybersecurity really is all of our responsibility. So I wanted to get started today talking about some of the executive orders that have come out over the last few months. Uh, let's start with the order on May 12th um, that directed several agencies to begin multiple efforts to modernize our nation's cyber defenses. A little context for our audience. So the White House fact sheet specifically noted that recent cyber incidents such as solar winds, the Microsoft Exchange and the Colonial Pipeline incident are a sobering reminder that US public and private sector ent entities increasingly face sophisticated malicious cyber activity from both nation state actors and cyber criminals. So while that EO did not specifically define tasks for the FCC, the agency does have oversight of our communications infrastructure and plays this essential role that you've outlined, um, especially when it comes to attacks. So within that EO though, there are some things that you can see some, some particularly relevant items for the FCC. I think the first is, and the most clear, is around incident detection and reporting. So the EO outlines a need for greater disclosure and information sharing um, around the cyber incidents that occur. So are there reporting requirements currently in place between the FCC and ICT providers that you would find a, to be useful starting points? And if so, can you give us a little bit of detail about um, where you see any potential gaps and how you would encourage others to collect or facilitate data transfer um, throughout agencies? Yeah, absolutely, Melinda. So there are a couple of reporting frameworks that do relate to outages already, such as NORSH and DIRSH, of which NORSH, the Network Outage Reporting System, is probably the most relevant. Under the present framework, NORSH reporting is mandated whenever there's a network outage lasting at least 30 minutes and satisfying certain other thresholds. So this is a, a standard for general, uh, general network reliability, which may not uh, be directly connected to a cybersecurity incident, but any cybersecurity incident that causes a prolonged outage would be subsumed under this framework. So uh, there's some coverage there. Most of our frameworks around reporting, best practices, et cetera, are focused on natural, uh, natural disasters because until recently, prolonged outages of ICT networks have not been regularly caused by ransomware and other cyber attacks. So another tool in the toolkit is the Wireless Resiliency Cooperative Framework, which is a kind of interoperation agreement where wireless carriers pledge help and capacity to one another and to cooperate with the FCC during times of emergency network interruption. So one idea of reporting of cybersecurity incidents separate and apart from NORSH, albeit perhaps using NORSH as a general framework, um, is uh, to, to do wireless wire, uh, the Wireless Resiliency Cooperative Framework. And so it, it generally, CISRIC has done a lot of work on wireless network security, and I think they'd be a place to go to develop thinking around a reporting system. So generally, I would want to see reporting of cybersecurity incidents affecting communications networks reported whenever those incidents satisfied certain criteria. Although it isn't obvious to me what those criteria should be a priori, and I would definitely want to develop the record on this jointly with executive branch agencies and industry cybersecurity experts. And I would also certainly want any such reporting framework to include not just cybersecurity incidents, but incidents at the physical layer, such as uh, the ones that I was discussing in my introductory remarks. Yeah, great. Um, you've touched on a, a second element of the EO that, that seems to have some specific importance for the FCC, and that gets to securing the internet of things. As you've mentioned, we've got this potential of tens if not hundreds of billions of devices being connected over the coming years. And as I like to remind people, um, well over 99% of them are owned and operated by people who really don't have the skills uh, to secure them, myself included, right? Um, so in terms of making security 
embedded in the process, and then also facilitating patching and updating and all of those sort of principles. What role can the FCC play to encourage or somehow incentivize manufacturers, the device manufacturers, um, to take those steps to both harden security and facilitate simpler security? These are great points, Melinda. You know, as you note, a huge amount of the devices that are deployed are simply not going to be managed devices. They're devices that may be running uh, very little in the way of an operating system. Uh, they're devices that once deployed are expected to function as infrastructure until replaced. So I completely take your point. Um, I think there are a couple of ways that the FCC can encourage um, this at the manufacturing level. So first, voluntary standard setting. The FCC doesn't always have to create rules. I mean, I know, obviously, we, we love to create rules, but sometimes instead we can act as a clearinghouse of information or a kind of industry arbiter that can help to solve structurally insoluble coordination issues. Um, serving as an, a nerve center for, uh, for smart people who are working at the detail level to connect and cooperate with each other is, is actually one of, the, one of the great soft power things that the FCC can do. And, um, and it, we, I think everyone can trust that we'll serve as a neutral arbiter under those circumstances. And, you know, re, and, and I guess the other side of it is that by engaging with us, uh, it's a way of staving off potentially inconvenient or inappropriate regulation and making sure that your perspective is heard. So that's the strategy my office is focused on at present. I think if we can just get everyone into the same room working off the same whiteboard, we might really be able to help key industry players to understand how updating manufacturing standards for the creation of, for example, more sophisticated receivers and consumer grade devices or subatomically tagged chipsets or implementations of, uh, implementations of RF fingerprinting, perhaps in a productized form suitable for local law enforcement is actually in the long run to everyone's benefit and will result in efficiencies. You know, and regarding devices being owned and operated by security professionals, um, the question of devices that will be unmanaged post-deployment is a very important one. It's sort of an open question whether the FCC has a mandate to address it presently. This may fall into general cybersecurity interdiction, but that's exactly the kind of question that I would like to put before industry so that we can make sure that if there is a rule in the manufacturing or the standards level, then we can address that. Um, the second is equipment authorization. So obviously equipment authorization is a core FCC power. It's also a blunt instrument and it's a big stick. And I think it's one we have to wield very judiciously. But nonetheless, it is available at the commission level, which uh, is starting to be uh, more active in withholding equipment authorization where devices uh, have the risk of being a national security threat. This is a forcing function of wireless security, but it's a strong one. And I'm hopeful that it's enough for industry to, um, to think about how problematic it would be if this had to be routinely deployed so that we can have other conversations and, um, and things don't ever get escalated to that level. Uh, lastly, I think the FCC can educate consumers about device security. And uh, right now there's, uh, I believe actually former, uh, former Chairman Wheeler had some remarks on this uh, recently, uh, uh, maybe in an op-ed about the, the difference between a minimum viable product um, and a minimum viable secure product. Uh, and if, if security isn't really a, a consideration in the consumer's mind, or the consumer has no way of assessing the security of a device, then they, make, they may wind up choosing a very insecure device for other reasons. Um, if we educate consumers the way uh, that, that we have the potential to do, maybe we can change that. So when we educate consumers, we often rely on third parties to get information widely disseminated, but the commission could take a more active role in this space. So if we look at the emergency broadband benefit, EBB, for instance, when we try to get the word out to consumers about the existence of the program and about how to apply to it and about its relevance to their lives, we worked with USAC, who in turn worked with community leaders and churches and civic organizations to get the word out. And of course, carriers also took a prominent role. So the FCC does that kind of messaging directly and effectively. But this is a situation where um, there's, there may be a communications role for us to play. There may be a labeling role for us to play, or again, the coordinating function that we have the potential to, to serve as um, among industry may lead to industry voluntary labeling standards or um, other approaches that will put security on the public agenda. Perfect. Let's stay on the topic of IoT um, and let's target it a little bit more to uh, 5G expansion. The commission has been working to free up more bands in the spectrum and to facilitate the spread of 5G across the country. Many proponents tell greater responsiveness uh, and the reliability of the 5G networks, uh, but others are raising concerns around privacy. 
uh, the amount of data that's being created and any potential risk that that poses. What do you think the FCC should be doing, if anything, uh, to mitigate these sort of privacy related security risks? Um, great question again, Melinda, and one that's very much on everyone's minds and on everyone's agendas. Um, as we've seen with uh, some of the fallout from the uh, European GDPR, it's possible to um, it's possible to get an activist in privacy in a way that um, where the benefits to the consumers are, are potentially mixed. Um, and I think you know, with with electronic stuff, it sort of falls between two stools because on the one hand, there's uh, there's telecommunication aspects to what's going on, which sounds like the FCC, but there are also general consumer protections, which sounds like the FTC. And it's a, you know, becomes a complicated question. Uh, sticking to core FCC competences, just for a second, a lot of privacy related risk mitigation is really about the architecture of 5G networks themselves. And there the commission has a, a clear opportunity and mandate to focus on its unique strengths. What distinguishes us in this case is signal and physical layer security and the prevention of uh, data piracy and attacks against PII on those fronts. Of course, it behooves us to work closely with other agencies as it pertains to user data storage and protection across communications infrastructure, when, and we definitely should do that. But what the FCC really has the biggest mandate to do, the best place to burn calories on security, is where its regulatory remit is clearest and where it can exert the greatest level of influence. So I'm concerned that if we step too much into, into the privacy arena, that would require us to either step outside the, our jurisdiction or, um, or on the other hand, it would, it would require us to, um, to do an inadequate job or to have to, um, or, or to raise questions about our role in the larger economy that maybe would be unwise to raise. So uh, on the other hand, wireless device security at the physical layer, that's, uh, that's clearly within our, our backyard. It's got implications, not just for the protection of user data, but for the proper functioning of the device for its intended use. And also I might add, for uh, the ability to pull uh, implicit data off of um, off of a network or off of spying on a network, all of which are things where we clearly have jurisdiction and we clearly have a role to play. As for the rest, I think I think that's a larger conversation, and uh, to the de to the degree that it's not uh, jurisdictionally clear already, uh, it really would become a question for Congress. Let's talk about uh, targeted mitigation efforts quickly. Um, there are many approaches to security policies, protocols, approaches that involve myriad technical software solutions. But too often, as we saw very clearly um, in the reporting uh, about solar winds, is that security budgets are seen as burdensome cost centers and their resources are typically stretched too thin. Uh, what sort of technologies do you want to see adopted? What, what are the solutions out there that you see promising uh, to help our supply chains? And if you could tell us where, if you're seeing, you know, more on the proactive defense side, the incident detection, or better efforts spent on the response, or do you think we should spread it out evenly, the solutions? Um, okay, so... Uh, I'm going to go on just a little bit of a tangent here. I'm, I'm going to be remiss if I didn't make a plug at this point for receiver standards as a concept. Um, yes, you know, this is related to the notion of physical layer security, you know, somewhat tangentially, but an attenuated connection is still a connection as uh, many of us have experienced. So without good receivers, we stand to live with a lot more interference, effective interference, that is device perceptible, consumer perceptible interference, especially as mid-band spectrum densifies. We want mid-band spectrum to densify. That's good. That means higher utilization of, uh, of a public resource. Um, but with this densification, interference will increase, which might impact critical infrastructure or public safety operations in a particular band, or alternatively, legacy equipment operating in the same or an adjacent band. So this has knock-on effects for security of devices, as well as just the safety of human life. So first and foremost, let's get receiver standards right so that we don't have um, a constant interference C out there with the potential for service disruption. Let's make sure that we fully close that gap. So second, I've mentioned RF fingerprinting before. This is uh, defense applications of RF fingerprinting are now standard. But uh, what we're seeing very often is that uh, technologies become productized down to the consumer level or, um, uh, in some, or at least down away from the, you know, esoteric bespoke solution level to the point where consumer adoption starts to be possible and agency adoption starts to be feasible outside of the um, outside of the great the greatest centers of expertise on that particular technology. 
What we're seeing is that machine learning advances on RF fingerprinting are permitting devices on the receiving side to increasingly be successful at a relatively low price point at uniquely identifying the transmitting device. So um, my view is that this is a potential game changer for spoofing and repeating attacks, which have the potential to affect everything from Wi-Fi routers to insulin pumps, not to mention uh, it can give local law enforcement an important tool in tracking down and punishing criminals, which um, is, I, I think, again, going to be a greater and greater concern for local law enforcement as criminals themselves gain access to more sophisticated tools uh, for attacks such as cloning uh, wireless key fobs for cars. Uh, third, supply chain integrity. So there are companies out there that can mark substrates of devices at the subatomic level and then read those marks with <laughs> handheld devices, which to me, frankly, sounds like Star Trek. But um, <laughs> But there's, there's the potential to, to store this on a blockchain ledger as a digital twin of the device. And I think this is a potential game changer for the integrity of the supply chain. Certainly, um, there was a piece in the Wall Street Journal, I want to say just this morning, um, about uh, fake chips being uh, uh, entering the market and everyone having to step up their game to uh, ensure that they're not being sold fraudulent chips in this time of semiconductor shortages. So um, it's... Uh, Techniques to ensure the, the integrity of the, of the supply chain generally um, have to just become a bigger part of our lives, just, uh, just as we've all learned to avoid you know, clicking on those emails from, uh, from foreign princes who uh, uh, you know, have so much money in their bank accounts but can't get it out for some reason. Um, security's got to be approached as an entire life cycle. We need chipsets and receivers from vendors that we trust. We need supply chains to be trusted in transit. Uh, we need clearly identifiable actors at every stage so that you're not, you know, um, so you're not, uh, so to speak, buying out of the back of a van. We need to be able to audit every physical element of devices. We need to trust devices in operation. We need to trust patching. There's, uh, there's always an attack at the weakest link, and there's no good moment to ease off the throttle on security. As for the larger implications, I mean, supply chains, it's, those are two words that cover a lot of terrain. So uh, the specific meaning of supply chain security as it pertains to the FCC, and again, I don't want to try and turn this into an octopus that's reaching all over the world. Congress wouldn't let us anyways. But, um, but we, you know, we have a mandate for secure supply chains um, in various respects. And I think we need to figure out uh, where the real attacks and threats are, where those are likely to emerge coming forward, and, um, and how we can best interdict them using some of the tools that I've outlined. Great. That, that's a great approach. I like to hear that we're covering everything from the detection to helping law enforcement uh, close the gap and, and deal with the bad guys. So this is a naturally frightening topic, and I want to give you a chance here to close on something positive. If you have some sort of a bright spot that you can share with us that uh, help us sleep a little bit better to, at night, um, things that you're seeing to, to help uh, truly bridge the gap in these vulnerabilities. We'd love to hear it. Uh, yeah, absolutely. So these are novel threats. So they alarm us in ways that past threats might not necessarily have done. But let's remember that, uh, that for example, elect, uh, well, uh, financial fraud is, is probably you know, older than writing. Um, if you've seen Catch Me If You Can, um, checks themselves are not invulnerable. Um, perhaps there's a Frank Abagnale out there who's going to, uh, who's going to, uh, who's currently committing cyber crimes and uh, pilfering Bitcoins or something like that, and is going to help us understand the cyber, uh, cyber threat attack surface. Um, all joking aside, industry takes security very, very seriously. The level of technical sophistication and engagement are really astonishing. That's why a key part of what I'm doing here is as much outreach to the players in this field, including the emerging players who are very often at the cutting tech edge um, as seriously as possible. So uh, the resources that industry puts in this are astonishing. Billions are spent in making that, uh, devices more efficient, less costly to produce, but also far safer. Um, if you look at the, at the amount of attack space that's been closed, whether it's in your browser or in your cell phone uh, over the last decade, it's truly, truly impressive. I mean, I'm old enough and was also on the internet early enough to remember when just you know, very, very simple JavaScript attacks could uh, take down a browser or a computer lab. And obviously, you know, uh, industry is, is moving very fast to keep up with new threats. Um, so sometimes these things are in tension and that tension, uh, that tension may come with additional costs, which is why I really appreciate you highlighting uh, the, consumer, uh, the consumer security sensitivity aspect of this. If, if once we've made this more, per, uh, more visible to consumers, including consumers at scale, such as school boards, um, then 
then we've maybe got uh, the ability to advance the ball more systematically within the government. And um, you know, one way that uh, one way that we can help at the FCC um, in the broader cybersecurity world is we do fund a great deal of equipment nationally, uh, or rather, the funding at least passes through us. So there's a degree to which we can close gaps just using the power of the purse, consulting with other agencies and setting, uh, taking their standards and making sure that those get deployed into the next year's purchasing decisions. And you know, we can quickly propagate things through many, uh, you know, through vulnerable communities, through new, new infrastructure deployments, through schools and libraries. Um, so it just, you know, behooves us to keep our communication channels open with those agencies and make sure that their thinking is reflected in our policies where we're not the experts. And on the other hand, in areas where we are the experts on the cyber security, on the, the physical security side, that we close the gaps there too. Because the truth is a lot of it is just that there's low hanging fruit out there. And if we make that difficult to pluck, if we, um, if we force scammers to raise their game, many will drop out. These are not necessarily people with PhDs in engineering. You know, these might be just, you know, people who, who bought something uh, off Alibaba or eBay and are, you know, currently running around a little bit, uh, a little bit unchecked, but we'll check them. Um, my colleagues across the federal government take, uh, take issue with, uh, take this issue with, you know, just a, a very high degree of seriousness and vast resources truly are allocated. If we step up and do our, and do our parts as well and coordinate with them, we can get to a solution. More needs to be done in certain ways. Of course, you know, sometimes much more, but the ground truth, you know, the background rate of cybersecurity investment in this country is not low, it's high. It's our job at the FCC to take care of the things that we're responsible for and to empower everyone else to uh, whatever degree is, uh, we, we can um, to, uh, to make the most out of their great achievements in cy cybersecurity for a more secure future. Great. Well, thank you so much. You've given us a, a lot of good things to think about and I'm exciting to watch some of these initiatives that you can champion through the FCC. Or, uh, thank you so much for your time today, Nathan. It's truly a pleasure, Melinda. I'm very glad to have the chance to speak to you. Great, thanks so much. I'm gonna hand things over to the very capable hands of the moderator for our expert panel talking about these vulnerabilities in the supply chain, Melissa Griffiths. Hi, Melissa. Hi, thank you for having me. And thank you for giving us the opportunity to follow that excellent keynote and fireside chat. I think there's a strong foundation for us there that we can build upon. So my name is Melissa Griffith. I'm a public policy fellow with the Science and Technology Innovation Program at the Woodrow Wilson Center. A little bit of a mouthful, just think STIP. My marching orders today are to take this kind of broader conversation that we've been having about supply chain security and narrow us down to a still quite broad conversation on software supply chain security. Whether this issue has risen to your attention over the past year with notable hacks, such as espionage operations and ransomware, or if you've been concerned about country of origin around vendors, or you're one of those people that have been following this issue as it's gained steam and evolved over the past 10 years or so, software supply chain security is a pressing issue. It's a pressing concern for private organizations and businesses, and it's a pressing concern for the United States, given the national security implications, including the reliable functioning of our military, our government, and our critical infrastructure. This is the topic the issue we'll be discussing in depth today. And over the next hour, we'll be covering a lot of ground, so please bear with us. We'll go from scoping out the problems we face with software supply chain security concerns to identifying paths forward and solutions. So without further ado, it is my pleasure to introduce to you today's panelists. I am joined by Himu Nagam. He is a partner with Venerable LLC, working with their e-commerce privacy and cybersecurity group and their cybersecurity risk management and services group. Tatiana Bolton is the policy director for R Street Cybersecurity and Emerging Threats Team. And Greg Rattray is a partner and co-founder of NextPeak LLC, a cybersecurity and risk management firm. All of these experts that I have today have extremely long bios. I could spend the next hour reading through their accomplishments, both ranging from industry and government. So we're very thankful that they will be joining us. We're going to start out as a little logistical note with five minute opening remarks, quite brief, from each of today's panelists, helping us set the scene from a variety of perspectives. Then we're gonna transition into a moderated discussion. I have a few questions for them, but this also, this session's gonna live or die based on the audience participation here as well. So as your questions come up, please drop them in that Q&A bucket at the bottom of your screen, right next to the hand wave, the hand raise, excuse me, you could also wave, but please raise your hand. Uh, drop them in the Q&A and I will weave those in as the discussion kind of carries forward. So without further ado, I'm gonna go ahead and start us off 
with Himu, who is going to give the first five minute opening remarks. We'll pivot to Tatiana and then we'll move to Greg Rattray. Thanks a lot, Melissa. And, and actually thanks to the Honorable Commissioner for taking the time this morning because that was a lot of information that he gave to us in that short amount of time. And he used the, word, uh, the phrase subatomic molecular level two times and he didn't just screw it up like I just did. So um, I wanted to actually take a few minutes and, and, and speaking of bios, I was actually told not to give my bio because it's gonna take the whole panel. So I decided not to. And I listened to my good friend Rick Lane on that. Um, in any case, so what I wanted to do in the next few minutes is actually talk about what it means in real life. Because people always talk about supply chain, supply chain, you hear about it in the headlines. But I think what's important is actually to bring it down to, well, what does that really mean for me? What does that really mean for businesses? What does that really mean for the people of this country or this world? Um, and I think the best way to do it is actually talk about a friend of mine runs a food uh, production company. And one of the things that she called me about was like, hey, I hear about this cybersecurity stuff. Should I do something? And it was kind of a fun conversation. We were talking about the reunion coming up and things like that. But that actually then turned very serious because what a lot of supply chain companies have is factories. And in this particular world of the food environment, as a factory, a factory has, say, 100, 150 people working to create all sorts of food products that then get packaged in private label settings. And then eventually they go from that factory floor, they put, get put on a truck, from that truck they get put on a train, from that train they get put, some, uh, put on another truck, and then eventually it reaches a destination in the back of a warehouse of something that then gets unpacked and then eventually ends up in a freezer and somebody walks into the front of that store, opens the freezer and says, yeah, I think I want this. And they put it in the cart in their own supply chain, put it in the cart, put it in the car, from the car, they take it home and then they eat. So it's one of the most interesting things that if you look at that world, we're all thinking of, is that food good? Is it gonna have no poisoning? And is it gonna be really tasty? All of those kinds of things. Like me in the security world are thinking, why does that matter? Does it actually matter from a security perspective? Well, when you start looking at today's environment versus many years ago when attacking supply chain meant stopping a train and actually literally wanting to get the goods inside that container. I want that, whatever it is, or I'm going to hold it until you give me money. So one or the other, I want the goods or I want the money. Now, when you attack, it can be as simple as a smart device is connected. That device is monitoring the big vat that has the food that's being cooked and it's looking at the temperature controls because a device looking at temperature controls can do a better job than a human being standing and saying, is it warm enough? Is it cold enough? I need to make sure for this many minutes it's going to be this. That smart device is controlling it. Well, Hyper gets into that smart device through a vendor, not directly through the company. And when they're in that smart device, they can just as well say, you know what, let me make it look like it's actually working, but I've made it so that the temperature in the bot is going to a level where it's gonna literally blow up. And that's why it matters to people who are humans. Cause there are people on that floor who are working every day, who are thinking they're perfectly okay. They have the good hat on, the clean clothes on, they're dust free, they're not gonna impact the food, except that machine blows up. That's a very critical issue to think about when we're thinking about supply chain security. And then you look at it from a different point of view. Well, what if a ransomware attack happens and locks the entire thing up, can't control anything, can't do anything. Now that food never makes it and that price goes up and somebody is saying, why are they raising prices on me? I don't get this. Well, it's because of security. At the core of it, it's because of security. Now you fast forward, and, and I wanted to actually literally use that phrase, subatomic molecular level, because there's, frankly, actually, there's actually a company that focuses on trying to tag, he said, subatomically molecular level tags called Security Matters, which is a great name for a company, by the way. It, it actually focuses on that. So can you control that, and why does that matter? Because when you look at counterfeit products, that chip, goes through the same supply chain process and ends up in the front of a military warhead. It ends up in a smart car. It ends up inside a house. 
controlling a microwave or controlling a refrigerator, that chip can get all over this world. And in a sense, almost like a virus during a pandemic, it is spreading, except the fact that it's counterfeit, it may not be made properly to control the things it's supposed to control in the proper way. And once again, you either have a national security level issue, you have a human being citizen level issue, you have a product issue, you have all of these things that you realize are in an ecosystem that are so interconnected. And at this beginning of it all, we thought, well, what's this thing called small supply chain? So I think one of the things that we have to think about is why does it matter? It's because humans matter, society matters, we matter as people, and we need to not only stay alive, but we need to have products that actually are gonna work the way they're supposed to and keep our economy moving the way it's supposed to. Thank you so much, Shamir. I think you did a really good job there outlining kind of the why do we care and what does this look like in practice? Sometimes software, supply chain security just sounds like a really long forward buzzword. And it's sort of hard to visualize that. So I appreciate you making us sort of a little bit more condensed in those thoughts. Tatiana, you're going to sort of talk to us a little bit about strategic planning and the kind of broader picture sort of hovering us up a little bit. Yeah. So um, if you think about it from uh, the human aspect and knowing somebody who um, nobody's knowing someone who owns a business who's affected by supply chain outages, I think a lot of us have uh, have seen some of that uh, become rea reality during the pandemic uh, with toilet paper shortages, which are, is, was a supply chain problem, uh, solar winds and uh, semiconductors, all of those things kind of made it real. And so, um, you know, I want to, but I want to talk about it from a broader perspective. Uh, today, uh, Republicans and, and Democrats al alike are taking this very seriously. We've seen some recent actions like the CHIPS Act, uh, uh, USICA, uh, the NDAA, all of it is moving into a direction of making some progress on supply chain strategy. Um, but we still have yet to sort of uh, accurately and, and crisply articulate one cohesive strategy for the United States. And so, you know, we're trying to do that uh, with a with an initiative called the Supply uh, Se um, Secure Competitive Markets Initiative, trying to pinpoint what questions aren't being answered or even addressed. So, uh, we're trying to do three things: facilitate a discussion and build connections between people, uh, provide some uh, good resources, and try to get people on the same page, and then uh, and then sort of propose recommendations. But uh, what I want to focus on is, you know, there are some questions, big questions that highlight the, the central tensions of this issue that we haven't really considered. So, for example, what is reshoring or onshoring? Um, we aren't, a lot of people have brought that up as a, as a solution to the supply chain issues, right? Bringing everything back to the United States, making sure that we're making things uh, making things within the U.S., uh, but if you think about it, we need to be considering our allies as well. Uh, we need to think about what is best for our economy. Is it really going to happen, bringing everything back on our shores, bringing all manufacturing back to the United States? I think that's highly unlikely. So as we are talking about investments, we need to be thinking about more broadly um, what we want to do and how we're going to do that. What is a realistic strategy and plan and whether geography is an indicator of security. So uh, the next question is, what does the United States actually want to achieve, right? So there are uh, limited resources and there are, there's limited time. Uh, I think where the federal government and sometimes companies get into a little bit of trouble is they try to eat the elephant whole. You try to address all issues at once. And if everything's a priority, nothing is a priority. And so I think what's most important is for us as a, as a nation to decide, you know, what is our main goal? What are we trying to achieve? Is our goal to constrain China? Is our goal to, you know, tear down their economy to make it harder for them to manufacture, to make it more difficult for them to trade? Or is it to build ourselves up as a nation to create resilience within our networks to 
secure our own supply chains and to build up our economy. Um, part of the problem, I think, in the last few years has been that we can't articulate that strategy and therefore our policies and our tactics have been fairly, uh, you know, uh, undetermined. We've got some actions going on in the federal government. We have some, at one point we banned Huawei, at one point we banned TikTok, but then we, we don't ban TikTok. Uh, I think it's difficult for both the federal government to focus it's also difficult for businesses to operate in that environment where you don't know what's going to happen from uh, with the government from a to day one to day 10. And so I think what's most important is to answer those questions. And I think for us, the right answer is to have a U.S. centric strategy, one that focuses on uh, one that focuses on building up American resilience, on focusing on our supply chains, diversifying those supply chains, and most importantly, including allies in those supply chains, so that we have a we have a smart strategy. Um, and then the last piece is how can a government or a parochial entity make common ground with businesses? Uh, I think we need to remember always that American strength comes from our economy. And in order to do that, that economy is based on business. And so we need to make sure that we are having those conversations, including businesses in the conversations, uh, in the policy discussions and the strategy discussions, that we talk to the people who actually, for example, work in China, who have, who have multinational uh, businesses, who feel the, feel the pain of, uh, of a policy from the United States that goes back and forth on any given day and the number of man hours and dollars that are put uh, into trying to figure out precisely where uh, where the United States is going. So, you know, I think we have a lot of questions. Uh, and so I'm eager to have this discussion and see where, uh, how, which ones we can answer today. Thank you so much. I think between you and Hima, we have now established what the concerns are and really grounded that laid out sort of the policy aperture and where we are and some of the gaps that we can now discuss going forward. But before we do that, I wanna give Greg his five minutes. He's gonna pull us from that big national conversation down slightly to one particular sector around critical infrastructure. Greg, go ahead and take it away. Yeah, thanks, Melissa. And, you know, I think I, I'll build on, you know, the, the prior remarks, but, you know, probably put it a bit more in an operational perspective, bringing, you know, sort of uh, both uh, national security operational perspective, including how national security organizations go after the supply chain as a way of achieving their objectives. And then having uh, spent, you know, uh, years, uh, JP Morgan uh, as the chief information security officer and trying to keep that highly digital enterprise, you know, rolling in a global sense to Tatiana's point and having to do it across borders and keep global markets working. The first thing I'm gonna do is sort of, you know, challenge a bit the premise and, you know, uh, Hamu did a very good job of you know, giving us a, you know, a, a very real world view of the classic thought about supply chain. I'll also say that those supply chains are empowered by a digital ecosystem. And when you talk about software security, you're not talking about uh, a typical supply chain. It is not a bunch of things that move in a linear fashion. We have evolved into a digital ecosystem that is constantly interactive. And if you look at the things that have come up, you know, particularly solar winds, you know, the Microsoft Exchange, you, I don't think you want to think about securing those reliances on those sorts of products and services as a you know, the way you secure the movement even of chips, let alone the movement of food, right? Like you know. That the movement of food depends on those digital eco that deep digital ecosystem functioning properly. But when we think about securing the digital ecosystem, I think the supply chain metaphor can actually be a, a little bit problematic. And I'll, you know, over, hopefully over the course of the next forty or fifty minutes, you know, forty minutes or so, we can discuss that. I think what you have to realize there is what we're moving towards, and I am just uh, of late becoming more and more not just concerned. I mean, we are reaching a point where, you know, we had, we knew about global warming, you know, 20 years ago. California in the West Coast is burning down. Um, we are close to that point with this, our digital ecosystem. And we know that the way we use the digital ecosystem 
is exceedingly difficult and expensive to do securely. And therefore we're not doing it, right? Like, you know, running a software reliant, digitally reliant business is a, it requires risk trade-offs and we're going headlong into digitization and we are not ready on the security side of things. So obvious, and our adversaries, intelligence and criminal organizations, let alone disruptive nation states, you know, adversaries understand all that. And we're seeing it now every day and every week. Um, I will tell you, it is not a new phenomena for intelligence services and cyber attackers to understand that getting inside the digital supply chain, getting inside software used by enterprises, SolarWinds is a US company. All intelligence services get inside widely used software. They understand that software is updated and therefore they can get in. It is scalable from the attacker side to go inside products that you know are gonna get inside a bunch of organizations that you wanna either steal information from, monetize that information if you're a criminal group or posture it to lock up everybody's computers, whether you're a criminal and conducting ransom operations or you're a nation state trying to disrupt critical infrastructure. I think we've got to really struggle with the fact that our headlong rush into digitization and use of cyberspace and the internet, since we're in an IGF forum, comes with risks and we have not equipped everything from consumers to organizations that run our infrastructures, whether they're financial or even you know, the disruption of the food infrastructure that we recently had through ransomware, let alone the colonial pipeline incident. Those operators do not have the, the tools you know, to equip them to keep their digital environments secure I mean, or their digital supply chains secure if we use that. So, you know, we'll get into it in the discussion, but, you know, um, one thing that I'm going to recommend, and it was sort of, it was brought up as a question in the, you know, the first portion of the, the session today, but you've got to get, part of resilience is just being ready to be disrupted. Even if you do all the right things, I think we very much underestimate, you know, the ability of critical infrastructure you know, providers, but you know, even if you, even as an individual, your own, if you suddenly realize your identity has been hacked, do you have a game plan? If you are a colonial pipeline and your systems, your billing systems are not used, usable, are you going to have to shut down the nation East Coast gas supply because somebody locked up your billing system? You know, uh, we've got to get organizations understanding that they can't prevent that. I mean, if they are targeted, an attacker will be able to get at them, especially if they're running national security grade. So I'm a very large advocate of being ready for those bad days and thinking through them. So I actually think that's unfortunately more important, at least for a prolonged period, we are not going to fix our defenses in less than a decade. But as we start to fix our defenses, one of the things that we should do, and this gets to hopefully something we'll discuss is public-private partnership. We just gotta make it tougher for attackers to operate in the internet, hide there, run criminal operations, run intelligence organizations. I think the community that's on the phone, you know, or on the phone, that shows how old I am. It, on the Zoom today, you know, realize, you know, realizes they have a role. Telecommunications providers, domain name, registrars, services, you know, these sorts of organizations have to be collaborative in, in, in basically making it hard for malicious activity to occur. We got to make it hard on the, you know, on the criminals and the nation states that are outside of the norms and conducting disruptive attacks. Melissa, I'll stop there for the moment and really look forward to the discussion. Thanks so much, Greg. As a reminder to everyone watching, please do drop your questions using that Q&A function. So not in the chat, in the Q&A function so that they'll pop up magically on my screen and I can read them off to our panelists. I wanna pick up on a couple things that you talked about, Greg, and use those to pull us through sort of the first part of this discussion. So you mentioned things like public-private partnerships, but you also mentioned this ecosystem, trying to understand what a digital supply chain actually looks like and the ways in which that is different. So we do know presently that both Congress and the Biden administration have increasingly focused on cybersecurity and critical supply chains on the software space and the hardware space. We've seen the recent executive order, which was just talked about on cybersecurity in the previous keynote. And there's also some now companion efforts coming out of NIST to implement that order, 
looking at defining what counts as critical software in that software supply chain. So we've heard from Himu that software supply chain security is critical for organizations and businesses. Greg has talked about that as a much more complicated issue than traditional software supply chain. For thinking about kind of going forward from there, how does critical software, that thread, fit into the conversation about supply chain more broadly and kind of digital supply chains? Is that the right approach? Is that the sort of same, kind of borrowing these physical critical infrastructure questions we had previously? And I'm gonna start with Greg since you sort of teed us up here and then work backwards to so Greg, Tatiana, and then Hino. Thanks, Melissa, and sorry, I, I'm in Manhattan. If you can hear the police siren running down the street, uh, that, <laughs> that's not an uncommon sound here. Um, so uh, I'm gonna take that at two levels. I'm gonna start at the national level. I do think it makes sense, you know, for um, the government in its you know, role in trying to create a more secure ecosystem to focus its efforts on the, you know, the things that they probably have a unique ability to pull together the information and understand underpin critical infrastructures and or are widely distributed and you know, therefore help uh, both the government itself but the nation as a whole you know, understand whether those key elements of the software environment are you know more or less secure work on the with the developers to make them more secure but also provide you know information and there's something well i think we'll discuss about how close the public and private sectors get together about things that might be subverted right like the government has unique insights into whether a given product or service is uh, subverted by a foreign adversary or hopefully criminal groups is both a law enforcement and a national security dimension to that. Then, you know, at the bit, but that won't map completely onto enterprises and enterprises also need to know where their critical functions are reliant on technology, including software, now increasingly dominantly software. And that map could be very, you know, will include niche little things that aren't in the government's big list of critical software, but that could knock out an institution because of, you know, a, unique small, you know, small software service package provider it has that does something critical in that business. And I think you're finding this, at least in some industries, sometimes driven by regulatory for forces to be understand operational resilience, which I think is a good move from a, you know, a sort of expectation of companies will be resilient, but you've already heard that theme from me. Excellent. We've got the resilient buzzword in, which I think we would have been terrible if we made it through this panel without saying the word resilient, and specifically operational resilience, which I know is something that you work heavily on, Greg. Tatiana, do you want to take it from there? Yeah, so, you know, I completely agree with Greg. You know, I think a lot of it has to do with mapping uh, from one agency to another, making sure that they're all coordinated, making sure that we're addressing, um, addressing the issues in a coherent manner. Uh, you know, I think this is where uh, CISA's uh, NRMC, the National Risk Management Center, comes in. They're working on or have worked on national critical functions. All of this should obviously be tied and I think has been uh, coordinated with NIST and their efforts on uh, defining critical software. I think for a, for a long time, we didn't include software um, into some of those discussions. We were, when focusing on critical infrastructure, we were focused on, um, you know, broad sectors, but, you know, we didn't even get to like, you know, uh, really putting in the SBOM concept until this latest EO. So I think that shows sort of uh, how far we are coming from where we have been. Uh, so, you know, I'm, I'm hopeful that all of these efforts will, will work together. I think there still needs to be more, uh, more support for uh, sort of the software supply chain security ecosystem. Uh, you know, the UK, for example, released uh, uh, an IoT bill years ago. We still have not kind of, uh, as the, the United States has not released uh, or uh, passed a law on IoT security. Um, and we also haven't passed the national uh, data security and data privacy bill, which for the record, I think is tied together and I think is critical. I think it's critical for the FCC uh, as one of the only enforcers of that theoretical law. Um, so, you know, I think we still have a lot of work to do. Very helpful, sort of reflecting on how far we've come as well as how far we have to go. Sometimes we just focus on that last piece. Himu. 
So I think one of the things that we, we should always keep in mind is who are we doing this for? And that's people, right? So I don't know how many times I'll get a call from somebody that says, I hear about all this stuff, but what am I supposed to do? And a lot of times it isn't give me advice. It is tell me what actually to do. And that is one of the greatest challenges that we always have is because in the cybersecurity world, there are so many different things you can do, but you want to break it down to actionable steps for that either individual business or that enterprise level organization, because what they need to do are oftentimes somewhat different, but at the core, exactly the same. And what that means is, for example, focusing on things like, are you running a attack and pen test every time you do a product change or a major feature change or things like that? Are you training your people. So you have technology, you have policy, you have people. Are they all kind of getting hit at in regular intervals in what would turn out to be a holistic approach to securing yourself? Which goes to really what Greg was talking about is make it difficult for the hacker so they move to the next, right? That's how you protect yourself. It's like, no, don't come here. Not my, not my neighborhood because I'm actually caring about this. Um, but people need to understand what does it mean? If I said to a business, hey, you need to secure your building a bit better. They're going to say, okay, no problem. They're not going to say, well, what do you mean? Tell me what to do. They know they're going to call their security or they're going to look at their locks. They're going to do all the kinds of things. But if you say that to a business or a person today, they're gonna, the first question is, I don't even know what that means. You don't, be, don't get techie on me, right? So I think that's one of the things that we have to start looking at even more, even though we say this every time. We say every single panel I've ever been on, we talk about that. How do we simplify it so that people understand? But I think we can't stop doing that because those folks are never going to enter the world wherein they're going to be in their supply chain world on the ground working in a factory. We're going to be the ones doing it. But so we have to now become teachers, educators, counselors, and actually think like that as opposed to advisors, which is a very different thing. If I may, so I Please. think that that's a great point because you, a lot of times people think that it's about buying something. It's about spending money on the next new technology or, you know, implement and buying some kind of um, product that'll fix, magically fix your security. A lot of it isn't that. A lot of it still remains to this day issues of not doing two-factor authentication, having poor configuration management, and not training people for against phishing attacks, right? Like, it's still some of those basic issues of training and uh, you know and protecting your perimeter that is surprising, but and and kind of sad to be fair. But it's it's an issue of policy, not about technology. And and, I, and I'll try to build on both Hamu and Tatiana's you know themes because I completely concur with you know right from Tatiana. It's people you know process and technology, probably in that order, or maybe process people and technology. But you, we are definitely at a state where you, there are no cybersecurity tools you can buy that are going to make you secure. Uh, most enterprises, I'll guarantee you, have too many tools. And they actually don't have the, the, pe the people expertise even to use the tools that they have. We have a massive deficit, which we all know, in the actual sort of frontline technological skilled users of the tools and the network operators we have being able to just run networks in a process, you know, a strong security process everywhere from, you know, the user not clicking on things to, you know, being in with teams trying to create secure edges and firewall rule sets to keep adversaries out. That is not easy, requires technical expertise, and there's not enough guys in the front line guys and gals on the front line. You know, Hamo, to your point, the other thing that we've got to do is business leaders have to, you know, now like they're all, they all know that they have to have a digital strategy. They actually probably know that increasingly, a you know, a great portion of most companies' revenues comes through being able to operate in the digital environment. You've got to make business leaders responsible for risk management for that. Like if, if your service, if your ability to take customer orders and deliver products to services and ser customers pay you, if you're running a business and you got profit loss and you get knocked out, that's a business leader's problem. It's not the CIO's problem or the CISO's problem. The business leader should be dinged for that if he hasn't done due 
diligence and invested in the proper controls and resiliency necessary to keep his profits going because he's going to get attacked, right? You know, like it, that is part of your norm. If you didn't have, you, you weren't investing in locks on your doors as a business leader and your security guy goes, yeah, I told the leader that, but he didn't give me any money. I didn't lock my doors. People stole all the, you know, TVs out of your warehouse. The business leader would get dinged if he didn't put the money into the locks, right? So we need to do the same. It's, a, it's absolutely a leadership issue. Uh, it, we remain sort of focused on the CIO or the CISO. The CISO gets fired if there's a major breach. Uh, but, you know, uh, we still have this culture kind of like, you know, uh, all hacks are bad. It means you have terrible cybersecurity. First of all, I think that needs to change because that's not necessarily true. Uh, even the best uh, protected systems don't keep all of their attackers out, but especially if it's a state actor. Uh, but, you know, it needs to go up to the highest levels. And I think, by the way, that uh, that speaks to the, the need to educate uh, and improve the cybersecurity awareness and uh, uh, of leaders, of CEOs. Um, you know, as you take an accounting class in uh, business school, I think you need to be taking a cybersecurity class as well, you know, from a, from a leadership perspective, right? What does an organization broadly need to secure their systems? Why is it important? How will it affect your bottom line? Because uh, I think that's the age where we are now, and we're, that's not part of their uh, general curriculum. And I, I, I want, want to take follow this up on what, oh, go ahead, what, what both Greg and uh, Tatiana uh, just said. My, my son took a class, um, an online course, because it ended up being online, but it was all about how to, be, how to understand business. And what they did was they took a concept and said, take this concept and put, go through all the different steps you need to go through and eventually come out with a product on the other end. Well, interestingly, that is the perfect place to insert that cybersecurity component to it. Because if you think about traditional business, everyone's been taught you need marketing, you need sales, you need pricing, you need to have the right kind of products. You need to figure out what kind, what is going to be your cost of the product versus what you can sell it for, what's your net profit, your gross profit. You're taught all of that, but no one is sitting down and saying, and by the way, you also need to figure out how you're going to secure it. And, and I'm one of those, you show me your great idea, I'll tell you what the bad guys are going to do with it. And then we're going to sit down and talk about how we're going to make sure that we put in the right kinds of things at the DNA level to make, make it less likely that would happen. So I think that's one of those things that we can even think about at the pure education level of the regular student who's going through without even realizing they just got trained in cybersecurity. And that I think you've pulled a bunch of these different threads, right, that are kind of come up in these conversations from the role of government and sort of policy setting from the top to very specific sort of operational realities and resilience to education initiatives and really kind of talking about how we approach security by design in our products and also the kind of responsibilities of businesses in this space relative to the government and other organizations. I'd like to take this public-private, which we've said now several times, um, and kind of pull it out a little bit. And I'm going to start with you, Himu, because I know that you have some thoughts around kind of hacker communities and visibility and intelligence, thinking about some of the opportunities where our private sector and our government can work more collaboratively together to achieve some of the goals that we're talking about. And I'll start with you, Himu, and then I'll go to you, Tatiana, and then you, Gary, can finish us off. Yeah, and this is um, what's really interesting is when we think of that word intelligence community, I think everyone listening, the first thing they think of is, well, that's the three-letter agencies, right? Nobody even wants to say it. CIA or NSA or others, they just want to say three-letter agency, that's intelligence community, they live in the, that world. But the reality is hackers are actually, have, they have to speak to each other to figure things out. People forget that. They're not going to meet in a coffee shop physically somewhere because they're working. One hacker is sitting in one country, another one's 2,000 miles away in a different country. They're all working together as a team, but they have to speak somewhere. And the intelligence community in the government sector has gone into those communities and they get their intel and they know what may be coming. They think about it. They, they do their counter, counter work based on that. But that's not actually something that should be different for the business community. So many of those folks who have done counterintelligence work in the online world, they, they say what, and, and I've worked with quite a few ex-military counterintel folks who have left the government. As they say, I got out and I got out on this date. And then they're either going to work for a DOD as a contractor or they're going to have to find some other path. 
unless people like me come to them and say, hey, I could actually use your skill set to put you back into the world you were and tell the business community, tell people like me, tell people like my clients, what is going on out there? What's, what are they talking about? Am I on that list? Are they talking about me? Those are the kinds of intelligence things that people are not thinking of. And yet, if you look on pure physical security, you got that security team that's working, walking through a mall, they're keeping their ears open, they're listening to what may be happening. They hear chatter, they go closer to the chatter. That's the same kind of physical world that you can bring into the online intelligence world and then bring it and use it in your business. Yeah, so thinking about that sort of public-private interplay, but also where that visibility situational awareness may sit and the role of sort of private intelligence collection communication should play in that so that we are situated in a position to be able to react to the types of threats we face now, but also in the future. Tatiana, this very broad umbrella that I'm sort of throwing your way around public, private, and this relationship between the two, where are some opportunities where you're saying, if we could really do this, I think we'd be in a much better position. Oh, I'm sorry, I believe you're muted. Can you hear me now? We can. Is that better? Sorry. So, you know, I think that there's a lot that we can do. Um, so uh, I was on the Cyberspace Solarium Commission. We came out with a number of recommendations to improve private sector uh, government coordination. Uh, one of the most important, I think, is codifying this concept of systemically important critical infrastructure, whereby entities responsible for systems and assets that underpin national critical functions that I mentioned before from the NRMC and at CISA, are ensured the full support of US government and shoulder on the other side, shoulder additional security requirements consistent with their unique status and importance. So, you know, working under that broad umbrella, you know, uh, we have to ident identify and designate these, uh, these entities. We have to insulate them from liability. Um, we need to uh, do security certification. We need to prioritize federal assistance. Um, and ident uh, identify and uh, identification and warning for intelligence support is important. So, um, you know, there's, the, but there's, there's more that we can do. Um, we also talk about improving combined situational awareness of cyber threats, right? And that includes things like establishing and funding a joint collaborative environment, which would be sort of a, a common interoperable environment for the sharing and fusing of threat information, um, and other relevant data across the federal government and between private sector and public sector actors. Um, I think, you know, some of the efforts on the hillside right now to try and pass a National Data Breach Reporting Act uh, or put, a, you know, provision of that into the NDAA is, uh, is key because I think that right now we're seeing perhaps five to 10 percent of the threats uh, that we know about and neither on the government side nor on the private sector side could you possibly protect against the vulnerabilities and threats that you're only seeing 10 percent of right we don't have a combined threat picture and without that how are you expected to defend your networks it seems uh you know it, it seems like fighting a losing battle which it is and so I know that we've had voluntary uh, threat reporting. Uh, we've seen sort of some of the consequences of that uh, of that system in the in the latest breaches and the continued uh, increase in ransomware attacks. So I think it's time now to go to a uh, non-voluntary uh, threat reporting, um, you know, uh, framework so that we can get this combined threat picture. We have another plea for better situational awareness, sort of starting off when kind of thinking about the intelligence community outside those three letter agencies that typically come to mind, and then thinking about some sort of paths forward there and that real iceberg problem of that 10 to 20% of your visibility and how do you address those threats and some questions about mandatory requirements. We may go three for three with Greg on visibility as well. We may pivot. Greg, take it away. I'll try to reinforce a bit, certainly what Tadiat has just mentioned. Uh, I led something recently called the New York Cyber Task Force, which worked very closely with the Solarium Commission and even tried to reinforce things like a joint collaborative environment and situational awareness. So for those uh, who are interested in sort of a more private sector look at what government private sector collaboration should look like, you know, there's that report out there issued just this past spring, but this building and in close collaboration with some of the U.S. government initiatives, you know, outlined by Tatiana. I guess, you know, maybe make it, a, you know, try to make it a little bit more operational. 
know, one thing, yeah, th three things, and I'll try to be very brief. You know, there is good public-private collaboration at times on disrupting criminal botnets. And, you know, the community that's online in this can be an active player in there. And, you know, I'm a very big believer that the private sector should give the government the information necessary for the government to use this authorities, disruptive authorities, but we should not have the private sector out there doing, you know, sort of proactive disruption activities and hacking back those sorts of things. But we need to make it hard for our adversaries. So, you know, the private sector needs to have the right, the government has to bring the private sector in because the private sector often has the best information about what adversaries are doing, where they're located so that the government can go after that. Uh, sort of building on that, the other thing that the private sector knows is the assets and critical infrastructure, especially systemically important critical infrastructure as mentioned, and give that to the intelligence community, to Hamu's point, that those are the people out there looking in those agencies, NSA, CIA, at our adversaries, but they should be looking if our adversaries are chatting about, you know, mainframe computers that make, that transfer payments, as well as looking for information that they're chatting about, you know, F-35s and, you know, major weapon systems. And that's the private sector driving the national intelligence communities you know, intelligence gathering and then as appropriate feeding back to private sector entities protecting themselves. Then, you know, where this goes in trying to link it back to supply chain, software supply chain security, is how are we going to build that bridge when the government understands that a certain product or service may be at risk from being, in, you know, infected or having added features that an adversary put into that product or service for their purposes, and how do we get that information back into decision making as to what's in our digital ecosystem? I think that's a you know a challenge for this decade as this whole cybersecurity uh, you know situation evolves. We are we are in a worsening situation. I, you know we can talk about that if useful, but like given that stipulation, we have got to do more. To, uh, to arm the private sector in, 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 even at the individual level to secure themselves. This is not something where the government is gonna secure the private sector. The government has to help the private sector secure itself. So we have some questions coming in. Before I pivot to a much more, so we've done the public private, we're gonna do the US versus international in a second, because we've had some comments in the chat and a few questions come in about, let's leave the United States for a second and talk about this global picture. But before we do that, we've had a question come in specifically about this conversation we just had around private sector security by design, build this in at the start. And there's sort of acknowledgement in this question that this is widely recognized, it's not a new concept, and yet it's not done. So what are the sort of tools, carrot sticks that government has to be able to sort of incentivize industry and these players that have a variety of resources at their disposal, some are better equipped than others to do this, to kind of start to solve this problem in practice. And since this question called out um, Tatiana and then Greg by name, we'll start with you, Tatiana, and then we'll pivot to Greg and end with you, Himu. So honestly, I think that a lot of a lot of those issues uh, are going to be resolved by some of the underlying fundamental things that we just need to fix in cybersecurity, like a national data breach reporting law, a data security and uh, a data privacy law. Um, we need to uh, doing more collaboration with the private sector. You know, there's. Right now, at this point, we don't really use a lot of sticks, right? We don't, um, and we honestly don't even have that much, that many carrots. <laughs> um, we, you know, I think uh, from the carrots perspective, you know, we've got sort of perhaps more integration, at, at least for sicky entities or, you know, um, uh, the systemically important critical infrastructure entities, more uh, intelligence support, more integration into the defend and respond piece of what the federal government does um, from the stick and you know we need to we need to hold people to sort of stronger uh, requirements have uh, more uh, sort of systemic uh, standards that are currently put out there but aren't don't hold people to account. Uh, for this, for specifically to um, to your question, though, I think labeling, um, you know, creating some sort of energy star or whatever, you know, the commission came out with NICLA um, 
a labeling authority. Uh, it, basically, it helps people get a sense of what they're buying, right? Making it more commonplace so that you know what that, you know, compare the iPhone and then an Android device, right? If, you, if the iPhone's got a uh, a security, a cybersecurity NIST sticker on it, then you know it's more secure than Android. And perhaps that's the way that we get uh, people to start putting pressure on companies to actually uh, creating things that are secured by design. Because right now they don't, uh, they see the benefit of getting things first to market. That is the primary driver of all uh, sort of um, all of the products that are coming out. And so we need to include security as a uh, demand from the consumer side for the uh, companies to start taking it, I think, a little bit more seriously on their end. So potentially creating security as a competitive differentiator. Greg, how do we start to go from this we know we have a problem to how do we start to address that problem when it comes to security not being built in? And I think the call out has been for a couple of decades that we need to create the market incentives for the producers of the technology to do better at security. Um, hopefully, the, you know, hopefully in a good way, the disruptive events, it can be a combination of the market itself just because you can, I think in you know, certain industries, cybersecurity is becoming a differentiator, right? Certainly in financial services, you have to be you, you have to be seen as secure and not vulnerable. And even you probably get some advantage from being considered at the front of the pack on security, right? And in, again, in many industries, the technology is developed inside the industry, right? So the, you, this whole security by design thing is important for, for companies that are digitizing and building their own tech, which is I think increasingly, you know, a, and you know something that happens, so it's not just the Microsofts or the cloud providers or the, the Solar Winds doing network management software. The the cautionary note I have is that you can make it as secure as possible, but if it, if you configure it improperly, it's still going to be in, insecure. And I think there's more vulnerability in how you know even a secured software package is run than it is ha hacking the code itself. And you know, in, if you look at what, how breaches occur, they're not, they're not generally going after vulnerabilities inside code though. They are, I mean, certainly patching is important in, you know, in these, these aspects of more secure software makes it easier to secure an enterprise, but secure, securable, software is also important, making it easier for users, whether they're large enterprise sysadmins or individuals with IOT devices, the security, the security features will have to be toggled on. They'll have to be security choices to be made. And I'll just finish with solar winds, right? Like that was the, the Russians inside the software development process for an update to a, a, you know, a continuously running network management system. This is not a, like, again, secure by design sort of is, a, is an oversimplification of, because people want, like, it would be great if they just handed us secure bricks and we just built a wall with those bricks. The problem is they're not bricks, right? You know, they're these, you know, amorphous entities that are constantly updating themselves that are fed by code. And that code for solar winds is developed all over the globe. So you can get in that code development top chain in other places like Prague, right? Like, so, you know, it's not, it's not a simple matter, but secure by design would be useful. Yeah, so kind of laying out that security by design, implementation, integration, life cycle questions. We have about 10 minutes left. So I'm gonna ask Himu to be incredibly succinct so we can move on to the global question as well. So in a minute or two, please share your thoughts. Yeah, no, I'll even make it shorter. In terms, in, it, it is easy for us to say government, public, private partnership, but a lot of times in the business community, people often don't feel like the government is watching their back. And I say that because when a breach happens or when something happens, what's the first thing people do? Oh, you're bad, you didn't do your security. And so what the business hears is, well, maybe I should just kind of be quiet, do those things. On the other hand, a, a storefront gets attacked, maybe somebody breaks the window, breaks in or comes in through the roof and steals everything. 
What's the first thing the government says is, oh, I'm sorry, bad guy attacked you. Let me go hunt down the bad guy and do what I'm supposed to do. I'm sorry that happened to you, right? So there's this notion that if it happens in the online world, who was the victim is actually not the victim, they're the bad person. So I think that's one of the greatest shifts that we have to do while we're also saying, don't leave the door open and do the kinds of things that we're talking about in this panel about being secure, but at least come from the approach of, yes, there are bad people out there. There are criminals who are attacking people who are trying to run a business, make money, live in this world, feed their family, do those kinds of things. And yet we're making them the criminal. And I think that shift will go a long way in helping that private-public partnership. So some shifts in sort of the narratives and the optics there. Um, and I know another thing that's sort of been danced around there is having some utility for the private sector as well. So it doesn't feel like a one-way street where everything goes in and doesn't come back out. In the last sort of 10 minutes, we're going to spend about five minutes here on global. We're finally going to leave the United States and look at some of these global questions. There's a question in the chat specifically about EU policy, NIS 2.0 directive. I'm going to broaden that out a little bit to ask us about that EU policy in particular, but how um, consistent is the United States approach with key allies and partners also trying to tackle this software supply chain question? Because as we know, no supply chain is US or one country and digital issues are kind of take that tenfold. So I'm gonna start with you, Greg, then go to Himu and then end with Tatiana and we'll sort of try to take five to six minutes total. All right, well, I'll have to be quick. I mean, I do think the current administration has a much more uh, collaborative approach uh, with with most nations, but certainly using alliances and trying to get on the same sheet of music uh, across the globe on issues like supply chain security. So I think that's a very positive uh, development. Um, I do think the, just the, I want to move it away from government. I it, on the private sector side, I, I see again, and I'm not an optimist in most things, but I see progress on. The, NAS, um, the adoption of the NIST approach and the cybersecurity framework becoming a more global approach and being used as a benchmark across the globe as good practice. And I think that's a very, very useful thing where expectations of a, you know, of a organization can be graded by, you know, regulators and entities around the globe in a, in a similar fashion. So yeah, I, on the collaborative front here, I do see some progress and I think there needs to be hope there. And I see the US hopefully you know, resuming its role as a global leader in this regard, but listening and enabling, not just telling, you know, telling people what to do. Kimu, NIS 2.0 directive EU and then global options more broadly. So I wanna actually take what Greg said just to another level. It, 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 and the question itself is, it kind of hints at this. When we, when we hear about international, the first thing that happens is people say, well, what are they doing over there? What are the Europeans doing? What are the Asians doing? Or whatever other region it is. And what we're doing is we're saying, we're almost creating a conversation that's us versus them. And in the security space, the conversation really should be, what, are, what, are any, what is anyone doing that could be the kind of thing that we can take and use for what we want to do? In other words, it's not about, are they doing this better? It's about, finding the best solutions, no matter where in the world they're coming from. And I think that's why um, when Greg says the administration's taking that approach, a collaborative approach, it, it isn't so much us versus them. It's we're all in this together. We all face the same threats. We all face them from different places around the world. So it doesn't even matter where any of us is. And that's, I think, where the true conversation needs to turn to. Because that actually happens in the business community already. In the business community, People aren't thinking, well, in the U.S., let's figure out what are they doing. They think, what's the best thing out there to solve this problem? Can I get that done over here where I'm sitting right now? And I think that's the approach that we need to look at. Being far more collaborative and then also being good magpies, taking best practices as we see them and implementing them at home. Tatiana, finish us off on this kind of much more global perspective. So, um, you know, so I agree with everything that uh, Himu and Greg said. Um, I think that it's really good to see some uh, international adoption of our standards. Uh, that's consistently been an issue um, because everything is um, everything is global. I think it's a I think it's a erroneous to think about uh, networks right now or your company or anything as 
uh, within a certain uh, country. Um, so, you know, I about the EU directives and all of the um, efforts that they're doing, you know, I applaud the um, the forward leaning nature of the work that the EU tries to uh, tries to push forward. Uh, I think we've seen both positive and uh, negative um, aspects of some of that. Uh, obviously, GDPR was one of the first data security data privacy laws. Uh, but then at the same time, we also saw them, you know, taking that step. Uh, we also saw some errors, right, that we, you know, some um, some issues with the GDPR uh, legislation and, and things that we can learn from here in the United States. Uh, I think all of the efforts that the EU takes and uh, and then we also see uh, efforts in China across a variety of uh, across a variety of these areas. Uh, I think it it I think it goes to show that the United States really um, you know needs to step up and be a leader in the space. You know, the way I see it is that, uh, you know, we are uh, a participant in the global economy. We cannot uh, retrench and we cannot pull back. Uh, we need to continue to participate in standard setting bodies in uh, in various international agreements and um, and organizations. Uh, I think it's critical to uh, to maintain uh, uh, you know global norms to enforce those norms, uh, such as we see President Biden attempting to do with President Putin uh, for the recent uh, criminal activity, uh, ransomware gangs within the Russian state's borders. Uh, I think all of that is important as we, you know, as we work in a global environment, everything is global now. Everything is global. There's the bumper sticker for the, uh, for the panel. So one of the ways in the last three minutes that I want to make sure that we hit on that I like to end these sessions, particularly this type of session where we cover so much ground, we're dealing with an incredibly complex issue that bridges a lot of silos, public, private, domestic, international, short-term, long-term type thinking, all of this happening at once is to ask each of our panelists to prepare a rapid fire one thing that they would like to see us prioritize going forward. So in rapid fire succession, what is one priority area, line of effort, where you would focus your energy and resources today? Or put another way, what is your top wish list item to bolster software supply chain security? And we're just gonna go through from the starting kind of lineups. We'll start with Himu, we'll go on to Tatiana and we'll end with Greg in the right. last so, three minutes. So that, that means I have to talk as fast as you do, Melissa. So one of the things we're gonna, so I, I look at is that, that core question of tell me what to do. I, we have a lot of panel discussions, a lot of conversations, and we all come together. We're all experts, but I think we can use this opportunity because it's different than what it used to be, when if you weren't at the conference, you didn't get to see it. Now the public can actually watch these kinds of things, and we should, I think, be inviting the public in and saying, let us spend our entire time telling you what to do. And they may take only 10% away, but that 10% can have a critical impact on their day-to-day -day business and their day-to-day -day success. Better communication and outreach. Tatiana. Um, so I would say, I'll, I'll go back to my opening statement and sort of talk about uh, the importance of a strategy. We need to answer some of the uh, cent central uh, points of tension and, and, the, and the questions that have remained unanswered uh, and unclarified in the United States strategy. Um, you know, we have not answered the question of what we want to achieve, what our goal is, uh, whether we want to reshore all manufacturing, where are we trying to head with this? I think we need a US centric fo uh, focused strategy uh, that, that answers some of these questions. And if I had a second one, and I'm so sorry, but I've got to say workforce. We need more people in the workforce. We need more diverse people in the workforce. We need to pull everybody in. This is an all hands on deck ish issue. Um, we've got consistent ransomware attacks. We've got 460,000 openings in cybersecurity. We need to pull more people in. All, all of these things are going to be done by humans. Uh, and, and that means we need to pull more people in. Strategic planning, and then we'll give you the second one, workforce, because it's such a good one. Greg, you get the final word, finish this out. So I agree with those. And then I'm just gonna say, be resilient and, you know, when the way to do that, be ready for a bad day in cyberspace for the foreseeable future. We are not, I mean, even if we do the right things, which we need to do and make this ecosystem safer for a long time, whether you get hacked or whether somebody you rely on gets hacked and you don't have services you need to do what you need to do, 
you need to be ready for those, you know, understand what situations are most impactful on you and how you're going to work around and work through those situations. You need to put resources and time and attention to resiliency and exercising for a bad day in cyberspace. Prepare for bad weather. So on that note, I want to thank both the commissioner and Melinda for starting us off strong with that fireside chat and thank all three of our panelists for really covering a lot of ground in an hour and everyone who sort of participated in the chat section, which was very lively and dropped some questions and answers into the Q&A. And on that note, I will hand it back over to the session organizers.